You're about to meet one of the greatest minds of the past half century. One of the great thinkers of the modern American scene. An economist, author, scholar, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and living legend. Thomas Sowell, America's greatest contemporary philosopher. Probably the smartest person I've ever been around. And one of the people I look up to most. In many ways he filled your societal role for the last generation from a different academic perspective. I'm just reading his book right now. How do you know all this? How does it feel to be arguably the most influential conservative economist of our time? I know you have to be humble, but has it set in? I mean, because you're that guy. Dr. Thomas Sowell. Tom Sowell. Mr. Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell is a trained economist. He's a sociologist who has written books about virtually every culture that's ever existed. He is America's greatest contemporary living philosopher. Anywhere Thomas Sowell is, he's the smartest person in the room. Does he care about how he feels about things, how he wants the world to be, or how is the world as it is? The main thing that he's done, in my opinion, is to cause people to rethink their assumptions about all sorts of things. Uh, not just economics, but about race, uh, about politics, about um, how, how we get along. Facts. That people greatly underestimate the importance of uh, love. The human race could not survive without love, uh, not even physically. Married couples, genuinely married couples, not domestic partners, are in fact better off by almost any standard you can think of. Income. People who are married have higher income. Uh, domestic violence. The rate of domestic violence in marriage is a fraction of what it is among people who are simply living together. The abuse of children uh, in married couples, uh, families, is a fraction of what the, what the abuse of children is um, among people who are simply living together. So if you put it to an empirical test, it's just very clear that marriage makes a difference among blacks. Black married couples have had a poverty rate in single digits every year since 1994. If you look at the poverty rate among blacks, uh, uh, it was a 22 percent, and among whites, it was 11 percent. But among black married couples, it was 7.5 percent. Right. So it's not so they not only do better than blacks as a whole, they do better than whites as a whole. So there is a difference. Facts. I haven't been able to find a single country in the world where the policies that are being advocated for blacks in the United States have lifted any people out of poverty. Facts. Black people have never supported, for example, affirmative action, quotas, anything of that sort. Wherever polls have been taken of black opinion on such matters of should people be paid equally or should there be this or that, black people have never taken a position that you describe. So it is not a question of what black people chose to do. It's what you, you choose to put in the mouths of black people. It is what you choose to, to project. It is not what any black people have ever said anywhere that you can put your it's finger on. It's what you on. choose to put into the mouth of the pollsters, as far as I can see. I put in the mouth of the leadership of the black Community. Like most people, I have never seen a poster. Facts. Democrats get something like 80 to 90 percent of the black vote. If that ever falls down to 60 or 70 percent, they're in deep trouble because they've alienated so many other people. If they see Biden for what he is, not only a phony, but an incompetent one. That they, they, they have a hard time winning elections at all. And so therefore, they must try to keep blacks paranoid. Facts. Please take to heart the lesson of what happens when you vote on the basis of uh, rhetoric, and symbolism and instead of using your mind. It's important to know what you're talking about. It's important to hear the opposite viewpoint and more important to learn how to distinguish whether, why viewpoint A and viewpoint B are different and which one has the most evidence or logic behind it. What earthly reason is there to believe that the government of all institutions can make health care less expensive. Other countries have gone that route, and places like Britain or Canada, you don't find the same availability of health care that you have in the United States. You have something like, something like uh, recently studies show that 30,000 Canadians uh, have gone to other countries for health treatment, even though they get it free of charge in Canada, and they've got to go pay for it somewhere else, and they go. Facts. I can't think of anything that the government operates more efficiently than the market does. I've done a little research, and it turns out that 56% of all American households will be in the top 10% at some point or other in their lives, usually when they're older. Facts. Wow. Over half. 
and over so over half so, over half will be in the top. All right. Yes, uh, 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 and, and and actually, in the, when you get down to the top one percent, it's even more uh, incredible. Uh, of all the people in the top one percent, uh, uh, in the course of a decade, uh, the majority, the great majority, are there one year. Only thirteen percent are there two years. Facts. Well, back in 1951. Uh, people reached their peak income between 35 and 44 years of age. Mm -hmm. And people in that bracket made about 60% more than people who were in their early 20s. Go forward a few years, and now uh, they're making more than twice as much as people in their 20s. And go forward another decade or so, and now the whole bracket has moved up to 45 to 54. And now they're making three times what people in their low. And, all, and what it means is that as time goes on, the advantages of youth, namely strength uh, and, and, and uh, energy, account for less and less because machines provide the power. But you have to more and more be able to do more complicated things. Experience and knowledge yes. matter more and more and when you, relative when to brawn. Yes. Areas that are unpopular or they're plagued with false knowledge that intrigues him to see if that's actually the popular opinion is actually true. And often it's not, he finds it's not. Yeah, it, it, the first time the federal government intervened in the economy to get us out of a, of a uh, downturn was in 1930. Now, which means that for more than 150 years, the federal government just stood by and twiddled their thumbs while the economy recovered on its own. And all that time, there was never a depression as bad as the 1930s depression, where there was all kinds of, of intervention, beginning with Herbert Hoover, help and help us, uh, and then amplified by Franklin D. Roosevelt. So in terms of you looking at the, what happened as a matter of fact, uh, again, there was, no, there was no Federal Reserve prior to 1914. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve was created in order to, one, cut back, cut back on bank failures, uh, reduce uh, inflation and prevent deflation. All of those things reached historic highs never seen before under the Federal Reserve. So uh, the, 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 the idea was wonderful. It's only the reality that didn't cooperate. Facts. My own family did not have electricity or a hot running water in my early childhood, which was not unusual for blacks in the South in those days. What, what do you remember about those days, and where was it in the South? Oh, well, I remember a lot because uh, I, I didn't, didn't leave the South until I was almost nine years old. Uh, in most of those places, there was no uh, hot, running, hot running water. We had cold water, which, which many other blacks in those days did not have, by the way. You moved to Harlem. Uh, what was that like, and who did you live with in Harlem? Oh, I lived with the same family that had uh, raised me uh, in uh, North Carolina. And uh, fortunately for me, they ran into a, a, a boy named Eddie. Uh, and so before I ever arrived in New York, they had decided that this was someone I needed to meet. But uh, he was able to tell me things that I didn't know. For example, uh, he took me to a public library for the first time in my life. And at the time, I had no idea what a public library was. It persuaded me somewhat reluctantly to take out a library card and, uh, and, and, and borrow a couple of books. And that was enormously important because it meant that I began to acquire the habit of reading on my own. Uh, you know, years before I ever would have acquired it uh, in the normal course of events. The first draft of the Communist Manifesto, which Engels wrote, uh, specifically wanted to uh, 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 dismember the family. And Marx uh, decided that that, that, that wasn't going to fly. Uh, and so when he rewrote it, he left that out. But, that, but that's been there if you follow the left back over the past two centuries. You see in there one way or another where they try to undermine the decision-making autonomy of the family. Third parties wanting to make decisions for which they pay no price when, they, when, when they're wrong. You see, when, 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 the, when the parent raises the child the wrong way, the parent pays the price when the child goes down the tubes. But these third parties can sit back in their air, wherever, they're, wherever they are, Washington or whatever, and if the things they tell us turn out to be wrong, it doesn't hurt them. For example, uh, f before we introduced sex education into the schools in the 60s, the rate of venereal disease had been going down every single year. 
teenage pregnancy had been going down every single year. I think it was the uh, rate of uh, uh, infection for uh, gonorrhea in 1960 was half of what it was in 1950. So all these things were going down before the, 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 the left came into the schools with their sex education. And all these things reversed and shot up immediately afterwards. But nobody paid any price. Nobody who pushed that paid any price for it. Facts. Those of the left often act as if uh, human beings are just like inert blocks of wood or like chess pieces that you can move around on the, on the chessboard to put wherever you want to carry out some grand design. But of course, people react to, to these things. I, I learned that people who are ordinary people knew far more than I did, even though they were not intellectuals. And even though I, I had read more books than they had and so forth and so on. And I spent several years like that. And so I never had this uh, condescending attitude toward ordinary people that so many intellectuals have. You know, it's, I, I realized those people know a hell of a lot. And they knew a hell of a lot more than I did about things that mattered. Thomas Sowell's essays and weekly columns have appeared in more than 300 newspapers and periodicals, including The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Fortune magazines. Oftentimes, they created a backlash. The television and the print media, they've wised up. They're, 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 they're just ignoring what he's uh, written because they, there's no way that they can argue with Tom Sowell. He's forceful in his opinions. He will not compromise any of his opinions for the sake of social politeness. Most of the foolish things that are said on these programs were said 20 and 30 and 40 years ago and refuted 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. By you! It's important to know what you're talking about. Facts.